What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Spring Leisure Podcast, powered by Rolling Thunder Game Calls. I'm your host, Hunter Ferrier, joining you in person today with a good buddy and co-host, Austin Seals. I finally got back over uh, over into the home state of Mississippi for a little while to uh, do a little cram session of uh, packing, configuring, picking up some finely built shells by Seals here and his dad, Mr. Donald. Knocked it out of the park on those. We actually have a, a display instead of a shelf like we had at our last uh, outdoor expo we attempted, or our last, but also our first. So we learned a lot on that one. Hopefully this one will look a little better, a little more appealing to the eyes and much more efficient as far as space goes. Because um, as of right now, we're sitting in here racking our brains on how we're going to get all this stuff up there and what all we're going to actually take. And I uh, wish I had an answer because uh, as of now, we don't, do we? We ain't have a clue. Mm-mm. That on top of a bunch of other stuff we got getting ready for. Um, but, yeah, we will be, and this will actually be kind of within the next 48 hours of this Joker air, and we'll be in Nashville, Tennessee for the unofficial official kickoff of turkey season that um, is finally back. And I feel like last year it was kind of missing it. There was something missing at the beginning of the year, and, that's definitely the NWTF Convention and Sports Show going on in Nashville, um, which will be Thursday through Saturday will be the, the sports show. And I think there's some stuff going on Wednesday, technically, for the convention part, right. as we learned, um, you know, throughout Saturday. And it's going to be a good time. There's going to be so many people there, guys. Uh, just some, just an all-around good time, a bunch of people that like turkey hunting. And, uh, and, and something going on every hour on the hour, and some of it's overlapping each other and it's a it's a lot to take in, but it's so much to do and so much to see. And um, we will be there. We'll be all over the place, but we're trying to kind of line out a little bit of a schedule on where we are going to be. And um, you can find us mostly at booth 304, which will be where we'll be selling the shirts and the hats and the books and all that good stuff. Where we'll be hanging out. Yeah, if you go if you go in the main door and go walk to the main entrance, we'll be and walk straight. Mm-hmm. You'll run slap in our booth. Yeah, if it's if it's where I think it is, which we're going off of a, a paper map here, but I'm trying to think of where somebody was uh, two years ago. The last one they had, I'm thinking if that's the same, you know, little spot. That ain't a bad one. If we're limited to a ten by ten, right. at least we'll be able to you know see a bunch of folks and get to shake hands with a bunch of folks. And so, looking forward to seeing a lot of people there. We'll have that podcast booth, and I don't remember where that was. I you know I didn't I wasn't really looking for it. Last year, I mean, last uh, last time they had it, and I don't know if they did. I mean, this this year I know they're going to have some plexiglass set up, and there's going to be a couple of other uh, podcasts that y'all probably listen to that I listen to pretty regular are going to be next door, and, and we'll be in and out of that thing every now and then, getting some cool guests in there. But we did try to set aside best we could some times that we will be in the booth uh, either seals or I, or more likely both of us will be in there just, uh, for those who, who did, you know, reach out messages and, you know, said that looking forward to, to hanging out, talking Turkey, swap some stories and shake hands real quick. Um, we will be there Thursday from four to 6 PM. We're going to be in the booth Friday. We're shooting for 3 PM to about three thirty PM to be in the booth. Cause, uh, that's going to be, it's going to be a tight day. Yeah. We, uh, We'll be, we're honored to be hosting the uh, the awards banquet that night, and uh, they're doing some rehearsal stuff and, and getting a bunch of stuff ready for that. That um that we'll be tied up most of Friday. Then we um, got to try to figure out how to put a suit on. Yeah, I I think I still got my one good blue suit somewhere in a closet between here and Georgia. But then we'll be there um mostly all day Saturday. We'll be between the podcast booth and the and the I don't want to call it a merch booth, but uh. Yeah, I guess that's what you call it, a merch booth. Yeah. Um, we'll be in the big room. Yeah, we'll be in where everybody else is, where right. you would expect us to be. Um, mostly all day Saturday. And um, and and with that, I w- I'll be there personally. Seals will probably likely be there just as often, but I feel like we'll be doing a little bit of swapping on that day. You in the podcast booth, me in the 
in the apparel booth and we'll do some swapping. I'll be in the podcast. You'll be there, but I'll be there 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Saturday for sure signing books. So if anybody does have a book, a lot of people reached out talking about, you know, they're going to bring their book with them to get it to sign. I'm thinking, I think everything we've sold off Spring Legion was a signed copy if I mailed it out, but then the Amazon copies. So a lot of folks have gotten an Amazon copy, going to stick it in their back pocket, want to get it signed. Hey, save six bucks right there. Buy it on Amazon, bring it to the show. I don't know how fast Prime can get it to you, but it, you're down for it. Um, two days to Raymond. Two days to Raymond? That's what it is to Raymond. That ain't bad. Yeah, paperbacks, they're still put on demand. You get it about within 48 hours of ordering it. And if you haven't yet, make sure you sign up for a Amazon Smile account because uh, you can select Turkish for Tomorrow as your charitable source right there. And, um when you purchase the book on Amazon or anything else you purchase on Amazon that is eligible for Amazon Smile Donations, um, a little bit of that money will automatically go towards the organization of your choice. And I know uh, TFT is one. I'm sure there's a couple other really good ones out there. Um, and then any paperback purchase at springledger.com, we're matching it. So we'll get to we'll probably make that a you know a monthly donation or something like that. Tally them up, send it over at the end of every month. But, so, we'll be doing some book signing, 11 to 3 on Saturday, and then Friday when we are out of commission for the most part, we're going to have some help from some dudes, some well-known yeah, folks. G- Gary will be there. Oh, yeah. Uh, waiting to meet everybody, talk turkeys. I know he is uh, he is fired up about turkey season right now. Man, you talk, I, I feel like I've talked to him probably more this past week, and that's when you know it's, it's getting in your blood and... You know, I'll, I'll see something. I I want to be like, I I got to tell Gary I saw this, or and I know he's doing the same. Just um, but he'll be there, and he's got a little something special that we're working on that we've been working on that I encourage everybody to come check out. Um, we're not going to spoil too much more than that, but um, it'll be at our booth, I believe, probably all three days, and um, and then for sure that Friday when they're kind of having to man everything. Um, giving us a, a big hand and, and it's much appreciated. He and a partner of his with Muscatine Blood, Bloodline, uh, Brad, will be there helping out a whole lot. So Brad's actually the the guy that kind of handles a lot of their merchandise with, with the band. So he's going to be a huge – he's probably going to teach us more than anything. Yeah. Now uh, you talk about – and he's a cool dude. You know, <laughs> i tell you how I met Brad. Uh-uh. When, uh, when Gary and Charlie came to play and, and Jackson a couple of weeks ago, we were uh, we had just gotten in there, and I ran in the restroom real quick, and somebody's talking next to me about being, you know, doing the merchandise and stuff like that. I'm like, man, I need to get up with this guy. He, he sounds like he knows what he's doing. It's the same thing, you know, trade show booths, uh, merch booths, got to be pretty close to each other. And wound up being Brad and talked to him for a little while, and then we've been working on this little collaboration project with him, and he's been a, a, a big asset in that uh, endeavor. So he and then uh, who else we got? Logan Cook will be there with us, uh, I guess, most of the day Thursday, and then he'll be there for a little while Friday morning, and then I think he's got to head out. So, Yeah, he'll be around, and I'm looking forward to seeing Logan. Hopefully, if y'all keep up with Logan, he's got that show off days on My Ship Go. So, um, but he'll be around, and I hope he hangs out as long as he possibly can because he's a cool guy and uh, one that's a lot of fun talking turkey with. Yeah. Love, you're talking about love turkey hunting. He likes hunting, but you can tell he's kind of cut from that turkey hunter cloth that his gears are getting going right about now too and he'll be there and we will uh we'll have a few new things that y'all ain't quite seen yet that we uh yeah don't spoil them you don't want to spoil them well, yeah we can spoil we can tell them about them don't post them oh don't post any pictures of them. let them see them in person all right yeah yeah we'll do that but uh but we're gonna have some and these aren't gonna be available online until after the convention these are pretty exclusive to the convention booth and this is 100% not strategic. This is, we didn't get them, and we're not going to get them until we're like, somebody's picking them up on the way to Nashville. It's going to be some um, some new bottom land quarter zip performance pullovers. Um, they'll be uh, they'll be there at the, at the convention, and um, you'll be able to purchase those before they hit the website. And then after the convention, a couple of days, we'll, we'll upload them, yeah. whatever's left. If, I, don't, I don't know if any are coming back. That's three days of a lot of people walking by and and I, and I saw a proof of them and they're going to look pretty good and I love those things. I didn't have one last turkey season, so I'm looking forward to actually hunting one. I've probably worn one every day since. I got one in like when they went on sale in June, just a mossy oak blank one. 
and um and those are pretty sweet. Those we got a new circle track T. It'll be there too. So that's not as cool, but it will be there. They're still cool. Yeah, they're cool, but not as cool as those Mossy Oak quarter zips. So one more announcement, and then we're gonna get into some some topics. I have no idea what it's gonna be. February yeah uh, yeah February twenty third. Uh, we'll join our buddies on the Speak the Language podcast, Lake and Jordan, and uh, have a live podcast at Rick's Cafe in Startwell. Um, be from six to eight. We'll do be doing Q and A's, giveaways, uh, and as they mentioned on their podcast, mm-hmm. we'll give a have a turkey gun to give away. That's pretty cool. I didn't know about that until Lake called me and he said, um, he said, hey, you want to do like a some type of quick reel or something, you know, announcing, making sure, because we're not necessarily announcing it. We're more reminding people now, right. you know, I think both sides of the listeners have heard about it, but if you're like me, I forget about a lot of stuff if I don't hear it pretty repetitively. Um, so I was like, that's a good idea. And he's like, you know, we're giving away turkey gun, but I thought he was talking in his like, you know, podcast, not podcast voice, but you know, he's like, I thought he was telling me stuff to say, like, you know, we kind of go over a little, little rundown script or something like that on who's going to hit which topic or who's going to hit which, you know, bullet point outline or something like that. And kind of how we do. But he, I was like, hold on. He was like telling me like excited. I'm like, Oh wait, that hadn't sunk in yet. We've given away a turkey gun that we're not eligible for. Cause we're like the four <laughs> people that can't win it. But, um, but yeah, I think, uh, pretty much anybody in attendance, I don't know if there's anything special you got to do once you get there, but I know you got to be there to get it. Yeah, but that's one of the things I don't. He told me there was a lot more stuff they're giving away. I know Onyx is helping out a whole lot. Um, yeah, he he was, he was telling me a, a few other things. I don't know if it's if I'm allowed to say them. So we no, we'll, we'll stick with. Yeah, that. I was that. We'll end it at that until we get some clarification on that. But uh, but yeah, that's pretty cool. We've already heard from folks from Alabama, Arkansas, uh, Tennessee coming down because that's I mean, it's pretty, you know, central location. Yeah, that. yeah. I know at least one guy from Florida is going to be headed up with the Red Mist Displays. He's yep. going to be personally hand-delivering a really cool, uh, it looks like a cupboard kind of deal. You know, the things that keep, uh, I don't know what the official term is. but uh, I'd call it a trophy box. Trophy box, something like that. You know, it just keeps your beard spurs, all your cool calls, collectibles. I'm going to put the, you know, the first paperback really messed up proof version of about of turkey hunters going going to uh, reside in there and a bunch of retired box calls that don't quite make the cut no more hand me downs from paul paul and stuff like that so i'm looking forward to getting that he did send me a picture it looks really pretty cool um so what we got today we uh we've been in here probably worth noting that it's uh 2 13 a.m <laughs> right now so uh, we didn't do too much digging around for topics, but thank goodness. We can hit the questions. Yeah, we found ourselves in this position about, not about this time, a little, a few hours before, one week ago, not having any topics, not having, you know, any idea where we're going to go. And um, so we uh, got a good stock of some Q&A questions and, and stuff like that that we're going to kind of sift through real quick. Not promising y'all we're going to be here for two hours talking on them because uh, I would say that we got stuff to do. I mean, I would say that we got uh, some sleep to do, but we got stuff to do. We got stuff to do. So, yeah, so we'll uh, we'll hit on a few things and those Q&As, those little, or I, I call them, yeah, I call questions. them Q&As, but the questions on Instagram stories, y'all know what we're talking about. Um, that combined with, um, if you haven't, we decided a while back to get us a TikTok. We wanted to find a way to Stay in the now, I guess you'd say. Stay in the fad. Stay in the fad. Yeah, I feel like we we are, we're not old enough quite yet to say like we're illiterate to technology and and things going on. But at the same time, I I still have a hard time thinking of TikTok and not thinking of like trending dances and stuff like that. You know. Yeah. But I will say like the more people that get on there, like there's some cool accounts like hunting accounts on there that. You know, there's a lot of how tos and stuff, and like all the way from, like I was watching some woodworking stuff. I'm thinking, like, I'm about to build me some cabinets. Got yeah. some, uh, what like a bunch of like ecology kind of stuff and all that good stuff. But I don't all, know, all kind of fun DIY projects too. Oh yeah, that's how y'all built them shelves, ain't it? TikTok. No, I, I didn't give him much help on those, but. Did you hold the flashlight? 
I held a flashlight <laughs> and sometimes some screws. There you go. You yelled at? Once or twice. Yep. I ain't never held a flashlight right my whole life. Mm-mm. I still don't know how to hold one. But um, but hit on those uh, since we got that TikTok. How I brought that up is trying to find ways to kind of bring some of the stuff we kind of talk about on the podcast and stuff to uh, a different audience. I don't want to say a different generation. I, I don't think we're that old, but but some. I mean, everybody's got one now. I feel like. Well, we started doing this little deal called uh, Woodsmanship Tips, and that's just kind of a little quick tidbits of stuff that if they pop in my mind, I'll I'll do one, and some of them are good, some of them are bad, and, but it gets people going with the with the questions, and that really does you know kind of let us know what people are wondering, which kind of goes hand in hand with those questions we ask on Instagram, and um just to, I mean, you'd be surprised that. A, the amount of people that say, hey, what is woodsmanship? And then at how long it takes to think of an answer to what woodsmanship is, because that could be, I mean, how do you put that into words? I was trying to think of it so long the other day. Um, but, I mean, in my mind, I mean, you tell me if you agree or disagree, but I think it's, you know, it's the ability to take what happened to you last year, you know, last season, what's happening to you, you know, when you were a kid, just noticing through observations, through experiences, through time spent in the woods and being able to apply it to right now and being able to apply next season, you know, when you're faced with a certain circumstance or a, a certain morning in the woods and being able to capitalize on that intuition that you have, that kind of gut feeling you get in certain situations and kind of just use that when it comes time to make decisions and how to get through woods and how to walk through briars, how to walk through a creek and not make a sound and, it's just constant learning. Yeah, I mean, that's how you gain it. I mean, woodsmanship is not a one thing. It's just a, I guess, I mean, it's just a combination of experience and, and practice. You know, I have figured out how to get through briars or, or loud, quote-unquote, grasses and, and shrubs and stuff quietly. Um, but I still make sounds, obviously. But and I, and I didn't, it wasn't an instant, hey, I figured this out. It was a, you know, or how to how to walk up a ridge, the quietly and then how to walk up a ridge most quietly is finding little drainages you know that the leaves will you know 90 percent of the time will be wet and if they're not they've been washed away and there's dirt you know little things like that and all the way down to understanding the concept of camouflage camouflage is not limited to a a certain pattern no matter what brand or pattern it is camouflage is blending into your surroundings and sometimes that camouflage is completely irrelevant sometimes that's I mean, that's all you guys, 100%. You're banking on that pattern, blending you in perfectly because there's nothing else around you to blend you in and knowing how to use a backdrop and how to use stuff in front of you. That's, and that's, I'm a big fan of bottomland because, I mean, trees don't have, I mean, some trees obviously do, but trees are, are bark and right. they're going to have stuff. And this is something my dad actually told me when I was a kid was, you know, if you're still and quiet, you can wear just gray or brown. It don't matter. You've got leaves in front of you. Don't forget about that, you know. You can, like, that's what, I mean, I think a bottom line, I think you're the base of the tree. You're going to have little shrubs and stuff. Stuff that's going to be there anyway in front of that tree between you and the turkey is going to block you all you need. At don't least sit, it break you up enough, at least. Exactly, just break up that silhouette. And, I mean, so, so don't sit there and, and try to finagle your way up into a rose bush on, uh, in the middle of the woods so you think you're covered, which I do like to sit in cover now. I mean, when, when it comes, like, if there's an opening, I don't like to be in that opening or in that road or lane or something, I like to have it going left to right more than anything. Just trying to call that gobbler to the edge of the other side and, and shoot across that road. You know what I'm saying? About right. 20 yards into this side to the road, into the other road, about 27, 28. And then you got about four feet where you should have a pretty daggone clear shot if he doesn't come all over. Because he's going to probably do exactly what you're doing. He's going to walk to where he doesn't have to walk into the open to see what's in the open. And so you want to sit not all the way in the open, but you can see what's in the open and then kind of account for that extra a little bit there. And just a little, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you can go into woodsmanship. I don't know if we got enough time to, to go into them, but between that and decoys, decoys was another big one. That was a big one. They, a lot of people ask about decoys and I can here now nobody likes to talk about not using decoys as much as folks who don't like using decoys <laughs> and they're right yeah but i did a, i think that was the first woodsmanship tip 
that I wanted to get out there was the reason why I don't. You know, a lot of people take that and they run with it or they hear, they'd see that title and say, all right, here we go. We got, It's like public land hunters love making sure you know they hunt on public land. Yeah. You know, and this is all fun and games because, I mean, I I fall, I, I'll do the same. I'll catch myself like, you know what, me saying that was on public land was really irrelevant, you know, <laughs> during a story because <laughs> I do hunt on private land a good bit too. I'll hunt wherever there's turkeys if, if I can get a hold of them or get permission. Um, but the decoy thing is, and, and I wrote the whole dang chapter on curiosity versus persuasion, but I didn't put decoys in the chapter. A lot of folks probably look right over that and don't know that whole chapter is about decoys. And, and, and honestly, the whole narrative behind it was that I was wrong in the assumption that only really good turkey hunters don't use decoys. And if you use decoy, you're not good enough to call a turkey in. You know, I mean, I pretty much flat out said, that's what I used to think. But as I got older and got a little wiser and got a little more experience, I kind of realized that's probably not the reason why. I mean, that might there might be some correlation versus causation argument going on there. But when it, and I'm referring to hen stationary sticking the ground decoys. I'm not talking about gobbler decoys or anything right now. Um, maybe one day. But but as far as decoys go. I don't use one because of the style I hunt, and that is, and I know some folks have already heard this spiel, but I'll make it short and sweet for those who haven't, is that I hunt based off of bird's curiosity, and and some folks don't do that. And a lot of that is mostly dependent on the terrain I'm in, between swampy, somehow there's swampy thickets in Mississippi. If you haven't ever been in a swampy thicket, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's really thick stuff, and it's also flooded half the time and it don't make much sense but hardwood stuff like that also as well but there's not a lot of fields not a lot of open areas where we tend to hunt and um just growing up how i learned to turkey hunt was um was to position yourself to to curate that curiosity and the gobbler come to see where you're at and and my point in saying that is a toting a decoy around whether it be in your vest or in your hand is loud is in the way your so much rattling. It gets on my nerves, especially when someone else has one. I'm like, here we go. But I'm kind of kidding, not all the way. But I don't need one necessarily if you're going to use, not because I'm a better turkey hunter. I'm not saying I don't need one because I'm a better turkey hunter. I'm saying I don't need one because I'm trying to talk a gobbler into coming around a bend in the road, a brush pile, uh, coming over a ridge, coming over a little you know finger ridge or something like that, or coming around some type of structure in the woods. That's kind of one of those woodsmanship, I guess you'd call it, but it's intuition on, on having a feeling of, if that turkey's right here at my 11 o'clock and I get right here, what's something between me and him that I can kind of ease over one way or another and make sure I call to where he's going to have to walk around that and I'll get a shot, position that within 30 yards. You know, you kill a lot of turkeys doing that. Sometimes they, they won't. Obviously, there's always that time. and. More times than not, I think, regardless of however you go about turkey hunting, there's going to be more times you don't kill a turkey, and that's oh, all right. Absolutely. You know, that's how it goes. That's all right. Um, it's just how I grew up hunting. I guess it's just and, – and having a decoy out there kind of cures all that curiosity by having it 30 yards in front of me trying to call him in there, and he'll get in there on the other side of that barrier and hang up. Another 50 yards outside of the decoy, mm-hmm. he'll hang up. And then, then, then what's 50 plus 30, and that's that notorious 80-yard hang-up stage they get in, and they'll sit there and gobble their head off, gobble their head off, gobble their head off. And there ain't much you can do then because you can't move around. And like, and this is just because I like to move around, go backwards, you know, call down this holler or something like that and try to make him walk, you know, over this ridge that I'm sitting on to look into that holler. And you can't really do that when you got a decoy because he's looking at it. You might can't see the turkey, but I can guarantee you he's looking at that decoy, and that decoy, by nature's design, is supposed to walk to him. Yep. You know, so he's going to sit there, and like the 15 other hens that morning did, is supposed to walk to him, and he's going to sit there and wait, just like he did. That decoy doesn't do it because it ain't got no legs. Yeah, he's just going to strut back and forth, yep, gobbling and yeah. waiting for you to come. And I'm sure some people are sitting out there thinking this. They will also do that if you don't have a decoy sometimes. But a lot of the times that I have ever been around somebody who has used one or I did use one, 
it's all, I feel like it was inevitable. And I don't think that's because necessarily coincidental or because I think that has a lot to do with how I call. And when I try to move around and stuff, that starts not making sense when that decoy is not moving. So right. it's, I'm saying it's clashing. I'm not saying they don't work because they do obviously work. I'm, I'd say more people use decoys than don't. I'm saying my style of moving around, calling down hollers, stuff like that, that's going to raise a – I don't know if Bird's got eyebrows, but it's going to raise an eyebrow or two whenever the, the hen that he's been hearing is now two ridges over and the hen he's been looking at ain't moved yet or <laughs> called. You know, so it just gets in the way to me. And um and that's kind of my theory on it, and it has nothing to do with what makes a turkey hunter good or bad, but um but that's I mean that's just kind of my spill on decoys, and and I can see how they are. I don't I don't know I don't I don't like using the word effective because I mean they're all effective to a degree, and everything's ineffective to an extent. Um, just like every fair chase is fair to an extent. Turkeys don't have guns. Humans don't have wings. You know, I mean, there's always that you got to have your, your personal kind of lines you draw um, in, as far as anything in respect goes. But, yeah, on decoys too, though, that that's probably my biggest turn off to a decoy is, like you said, I've, I've seen, and, and we hunt together a lot, I put a decoy in my truck when turkey season starts, mm-hmm. and it probably does not come out of my truck until turkey season is over and I mm-hmm. take it and hang it back up. But I've had way more turkeys get out there to that 80-yard mark, 100-yard mark, and you can watch them. Yeah. You can sit there and watch them strut back and forth, and they will never break and come. And more times than not, when you have that situation without a decoy, even if you don't move, mm-hmm. which when I get, I'm more of the, you're more of the run and gun, move around. I'm more of the patience. Right. And more times than not, if you see a turkey, hang up at 80 yards and he's strutting back and forth and you don't have a decoy Mm -hmm. and you can you can throw your call behind you just soft call Mm -hmm. throw your call behind you and he's finally he will eventually it's going to take a while curiosity is going to eventually get him and he's going to slip in now you may sit there an hour an hour or so watching him Mm -hmm. waiting but more times than not he's going to eventually and he may not gobble he may quit gobbling Mm -hmm. but he's going to eventually slip in and see what was going on i think i want to say what book is that the wild turkey in his hunting, McAnally redid, yeah. or I don't know if he was original or the reauthor. It's kind of weird how they they did that. Um, Jordan, I think, was the other author, whichever one was the original one. I'm not positive, but someone finished the book and it was written. It's up there. I got like Tenth Legion Old Pro. That's probably number three. Um, it's a it's a cool and it's a cool book. It's it was written like. I think of the late 1800s, but about turkeys. And it's so cool to see how they haven't changed a bit. And and I know specifically I'm thinking of a little, I don't know if it was a chapter, but a, a little stint in the book of him talking about, if you sit here all day, every turkey's going to come back and, you know, he believes firmly that he will lay eyes on wherever you last kind of called and will come back. Eventually, sometime that day, it might be 3 p.m., but he's, it will eat at his curiosity, his you know, in the back of his mind until he has to just kind of check it all. Almost OCD, I feel like that's what I think of when I when I heard it or read it that um that I, a turkey's gonna come back and at least lay eyes on that for two seconds, eventually one time in that day, just to make sure that hen ain't still there to see where that hen was. So if he hears it again, he'll come back. Kind of like we talk about doing woodsmanship wise, like you bust a hunt, you don't hear one you still want to see how that land's going to look for you know next time when he what made him hang up here was it this decoy was it a creek was it you know something uh i've I've seen more times than not me not knowing they cut a section of land and them hanging up for no reason because last year it looked fine but they cut it and it's just a you know it's that edge you know they'll hang up on those edges kind of like did They'll uh they'll get to the end of one of them, whether at the end of the woods or the end of the cutover, but they won't go in the other. Right. I watched one in Tennessee this year with Jay and Tyler Chambers up there. He and we were calling it another turkey. Tyler was on the other side of us. I don't think he knew this turkey was even here because he almost walked up. He thought I think he thought he saw like when he walked up, I had my mask on. He was like, uh oh, like I just bumped the turkey away from these guys. Jay was behind me a good bit because I I came up to the top of a 
uh, I guess it was ridge. It was just like a drop off down to a creek. Um, but it flattened out into kind of a pasture, but it had a fence line going through it with some um, cedars going down it. And I, and I couldn't see the turkey back here. I mean, he was gobbling. This was probably 1 p.m. late season, so you can imagine, you know, how that goes. You get one fired at 1 p.m. late season, he's feeling it. Yeah. So he's gobbling every step of the way. You can almost draw a line where he was walking. And he got to that fence line. I said, I mean, I know he's, he's going to hit that, quote, unquote, edge or barrier. He's going to come down, and he's going to get to this spot. He's going to walk around this rock. And here I am, you know, kind of like walking straight up as he's gobbling, let me know exactly where he is. I'm like, this is, I ain't going to say it's easy, but like, we've been, this is day one and a half into it, and we didn't kill one, so we've earned it at the end of the day, I feel like. And he gets almost to that rock, but he never made it to that rock because of, I get frustrated thinking about it, the shadows stop. He walked in the shack. Cause like when I went back and looked, I was like, why is he doing that? He'd walk on this side of the fence. It's like a fence, but it's like half of it's not really a fence. It's just like just a tree line. I'm sure a, tr- a fence used to be there or something, but it's just a line of trees. And he would walk down. He had to walk around the um, kind of, I don't know how he got, I guess I didn't see him, so I don't know how he got across the field or why that was okay. But he came down, he'd walk on this side because the shadows were over here, and then they were, they were bigger on this side, and he'd kind of walk around this side. He was kind of weaving in and out of them, and the shadows stopped for, like, I'm telling you, about eight feet. It's just a tree a tree had been cut down or something. I have no idea. He comes down, and there's just this eight-foot strip of light. Nope. Would not, Wouldn't for the us. life of him, walk those eight feet to get back in the shadows and come around that rock. So... Had I had a decoy in that situation, probably would have been a dead turkey. But now I know, you know, just through that experience, keep that in mind. Don't bank on this barrier if there's a barrier before that barrier. Right. You know? I mean, I still if I don't learn something next year that I didn't know the year before, that ain't a good turkey season. So, I mean, I count that as a win. Just saying, just realizing firsthand that even in the style that I do hunt, banking on those physical barriers they walk around, you got to – you got to make sure you get the first one that he's going to come to because if he gets to that barrier and don't come around it or doesn't come through it, I guess you'd say, might should have banked on that one, I guess. Yeah. I don't know how I would have in hindsight, but we'll see. But, yes, that's, I guess that's my two cents on decoys, and I keep an open mind. I hear, I mean, I, when it comes to filming hunts and stuff, I can see how big of a uh, asset they are to, to helping out with that because – it ain't easy filming turkeys. I've tried it, you know. Um, and then with, with kids, totally see how they can benefit that. And there's, I totally see folks, you know, just getting fired up about gobblers, you know, reacting to decoys, and you get that 30 seconds of just, like, kind of admiring a bird, strutting around it and stuff like that. It's just it don't it don't mesh well with kind of how I go about things. And that's just, that's completely personal stuff, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a decoy. You know, I just saying we don't prefer yeah. using them. Yeah. But to each their own. And I'm, I'm always open to hear reasons why and why not. But I do like the word why in turkey hunting. Not that I just don't use them because I don't need them or I just don't use them because never have, never will. Just hard headed. That's kind of how, that's what I was talking about. That whole chapter is explaining how I, that changed. It didn't make me start using them, but it made me realize why I didn't. What's another one we got? A bird's temp. Um, checking a bird's temp. If um, if a bird goes cold, how do you raise his temp? Just, that's a mm-hmm. that's a another that, wisdomship and temp. So that's pretty easy to know what they're talking about but hard to put into words i guess you'd say um but a bird's temp is this is in my mind i get everybody's got a little bit different i'm sure but their their figurative temperature on any given morning specific to that bird um could be high could be low but there's and in my mind it's an all-around temp too like the the woods temp it's kind of what I kind of go off of. And then I've seen birds fire up on a all-around low-tip morning. And we're not talking Fahrenheit and Celsius. We're talking about 
vocalizations, um, the communication between the animals, mainly goblin. Yeah. Really. Not all the way, and I say not all the way because you can you can tell if a bird's not goblin or if it's not a good goblin day. This was one of them little wisdom tips we did, and a lot of people chimed in asking to elaborate on that a little more. Um, with songbirds, whether it be owls, crows, um, just tweety birds you see here everywhere, if they're not too fired up in the morning, and you can get out there 30 minutes before daylight, you're going to be hearing some type of something going on. All the way down to you know hoot owls and whippoorwills, yeah, stuff like that. You can you can get there, and I love getting there and, and getting out and kind of I like to you know drink coffee or something like that, get my stuff together, find my stuff most yeah, times. That's what I was about to say, <laughs> find it, find what I figure out what I have left or lost. Uh, about thirty minutes before daylight or thirty minutes before I'd go try to, you know, start my little walk wherever I'm gonna go to try to listen. Um, sometimes that's 30 minutes before daylight. Sometimes it's two 30 in the morning. I don't know. But regardless, when you get out of the truck, you kind of start hearing those kind of nighttime birds. You're like, yeah, whatever it is, is right tonight. It's going to be, day. It's gonna be right in the morning. And, um, that's a good feeling. Um, you step out of the truck and you hear hoot owls everywhere and you start hearing crows everywhere and twitty birds. As much as I hate them kind of getting in the way of, of listening for a gobble, you know it's going to be a good day. The barometric pressure is right, which to me is, I say, 30.3 to 31.1. For some reason, when I was 18, I, I wrote that down in a little notebook saying that when it was below that, I didn't hear much. And when it was above that, which I don't even remember it really getting above that, I just know that was the highest I probably ever wrote one down in my really inconsistent tally marks. I'd write in some little paperback notebook I had in my truck. Just tried to stick them up as much as possible. I wish I knew where that was now. But I do remember those things. Was Barometric pressure was having so much to do with it. And the more you look it up and the more you research barometric pressure, there is data on it, and it is pretty consistent with that. Higher range, the higher the better. Those humid, muggy mornings, you're not going to hear a lot of turkeys. You're not going to hear a lot of songbirds. You're not going to hear a lot of tweety birds, crows, owls, all that stuff. But I say that to say this. Save yourself some time on going in there and busting some gobblers for tomorrow's hunt when they are gobbling real good. You're going to approach that hunt to me a little differently than you would trying to listen for a gobble. If you know though everything else is cutting up, everything's very active, and you're not hearing a gobble, they're probably in a turkey there to gobble, or something's keeping him from gobbling already. But if he ain't cutting up, nothing else is cutting up, that's not the time you go just trekking through and all kinds of stuff to me. You want to, you want to, and my and this is how I think, literally, is when it when I'm slipping through and I don't know where a turkey is or I don't know if a turkey is around, or especially them if it's raining, if it's real humid or whatever, and I'm out there hunting, I in my mind there's a turkey within a hundred yards at all times until I my butt's in a truck, I'm within a hundred yards of a turkey and I treat it like that, and I mean, very disciplined on that. Like it's pouring down rain, my face mask is on, kind of deal, just because you never know. And because and they're they're not vocal, they're not gobbling at a, it's a slam of a car door, or a train, or anything. They're not gobbling at a hen cackling. But I say that also. You want to match the bird's temp. That's kind of the rule of thumb. There is to match the bird's temp, match the hen's temp. You hear a bunch of hens cutting up at your eye to cut up. You know, listen to us, man. That's why God let them gobble in my mind is for you to hear it. But if they're not, the hens aren't cutting up. They're not gobbling much. Don't go in there with the long yelps and the, you know, cutting up left and right because you're not going to sound like a turkey. You might sound like a turkey on a good morning, but you ain't going to sound like a turkey on a bad morning because a uh, turkey ain't going to be doing that. Right. So uh, you, you can kind of, you know, blow your cover real quick by hopping out of the truck and getting to cranking on a box call on a morning that they shouldn't be yelping. But turkeys still make turkey sounds regardless of temp, and that's kind of, where I'm kind of getting to is turkey still scratch. That's a noise. Turkey still pop the wings pretty regularly. You know, they stand there and do that little wing pop. They still fly across creeks. They still get in fights. They still, they'll still cut here and there. Reactive noises more than communication noises. What makes them react to a noise or something they can't help is flying. You know, that's going to make a noise. 
I will do stuff like that just to see if I can get one to gobble or do something like that. You ain't got nothing else to lose if they ain't. If you have no idea where they are, you ain't got nothing to lose by going to a creek and doing some wing flaps flying across a creek, something like that. You know, anything, scratch, find some good thick hardwoods. Where there's a bunch of acorns. Figure out where they might have already scratched a while back. Probably not that day before. I don't like going in and scratching around where they've just walked through scratching. But there's all kinds of stuff you can do regardless of, of the weather. And, and that's just kind of treat it like there's a turkey with, around you at all times. Turkeys still make noises when they're not gobbling. Oh, um, yeah. And that, I mean, and then birds will get silent on you. So, I mean, I treat that the same. Like, I don't I don't just hop up and walk out. If a bird's been silent, I treat it like he either left or – I think that was the original question. It wasn't about them being silent in the morning. It was about them going silent. Yeah. I don't know how I got down that rabbit hole. But, um, but yeah, when they go silent, I love that because – I like to get silent back with them. Every now and then I will try to see, all right, it's been too long. But usually they're in the exact same spot. And a lot of times, obviously, early season, they're going to be breeding hens and stuff. I give it a 15-minute little threshold. If he's gobbling every 15 minutes on the hour, on the hour, on the minute or so, I like to think that that's, you know, him, him breeding the hens he's with. And he'll, you know, do four or five gobbles real, loud, you know, real close together. Every fifteen minutes, he's he's with a group of hens, and you're you got to tick it in line at that point. I feel like um, staying relevant, staying in his ear, helps a lot during those situations. A lot of times, just being quiet. If they go quiet, I like to be quiet. I don't like we talk about moving a lot earlier. I don't like moving in those quiet times because he could be staying in those same exact footprints he was an hour and a half ago when you heard him gobble ass, and he could be. 15 yards from you and you just don't know it i like to move a lot but i like to move before he's got time to readjust his snooze from gobbling if i know for a fact i'm gonna be moving after this if, I, if i've got an idea of which way i'm gonna go if i know the land if i don't i'm gonna find out pretty quick you know might be a little more hesitant on you know trying to get there quicker but i'm gonna you know kind of read it as it go i'll wait till that next guy I'll, I'll if i gotta sit there for 40 eight minutes until he gobbles again. When he does, sometimes he's 200 yards away. Sometimes he's in the exact same spot, but I don't know. I've, I've, I've bumped a lot of turkeys because he goes silent and I go silent. He thinks I'm walking away. I think he's walking away. Uh-uh. We meet in the middle and he lives <laughs> more times than not. And I look like an idiot. You'd think I learned my lesson after a two or three times of that, but I try to, Keep that, and that's probably why I'm so gun shy on leaving my mask down when I'm walking around and I don't hear birds. I I know they can be anywhere at any time. But going back to just turkey noises, I mean, you ain't got to sit there and yelp. If those if those hens aren't yelping, if you're close enough to hear the hens, should be at least, and you don't hear much, you I think there's a chance you can you can talk them away. But or a lot nothing of else, just waste your time. Yeah, I mean, I don't think. I think you're kind of more, you have a better shot at at letting them know you're not a real turkey when you start doing stuff that the real turkeys aren't doing. So they're just scratching around purring. Guess what you probably need to be doing? Scratching around purring. Mm -hmm. Silent gobblers are just fun to hunt to me. I do love hearing gobbles, but ones that gobble here and there, because that's the suspense time. Kind of like, all right, so relaying back to earlier, we're talking about people hunting differently saying that some people love watching them strut in, strut around the decoy. I can see how that's really cool. Or even the folks that, you know, they just like them coming in beating up the Jake decoy and stuff like that. Like, I can see how that's cool because, like, I think I have, like, an odd fascination with that silent period. Like, that's the suspense to me probably way greater than them, than folks that, that usually sit on the same tree for a long period of time, know the land, know the route that a turkey usually takes and stuff stuff that i i don't spend much time studying which way they go every day because usually it's the first time i've ever been there i have no idea i don't have time to learn that before i gotta leave so but that i, I would relate that to that that suspense that's what, kind of what i what draws me to the woods more than anything is not knowing if that turkey's headed here my heart's beating just as fast as if i watched him walk in 200 yards to come you know make 
15 loops around a decoy, 15 yards in front of me. That feeling to me is, is me not knowing where he's at at all and knowing that he could be 15 yards on the other side of that brush pile. And, and I'm just waiting for that right there in my face. But that whole time, not knowing if he's about to, even if he's, he could be 250 yards away, doesn't even know I exist. But the fact that I think he's on the other side of that brush pile about to do that, that kind of gives me going just as much. And when he does, it's, I mean, it's hard to beat to me. I agree 100% with you on that. Glad you're still awake with us. I'm good. You good hanging in there? We uh we only got, was it 720 shirts to fold? Let's see. Something like that. 720 shirts and 1,240. <laughs> What's that? We got to somehow get put in these daggum things. Yep, 1,200 shirts, 720 hats. That's what it was. We got a sort, count, all that stuff. May be done by sunrise if we're lucky. And that ain't even the start of it. We're going to get this joker out the way, and we're looking forward to seeing a bunch of folks there. Oh, yeah. I'm excited about it. Yeah, I ain't not excited, but I ain't bummed about it one bit. I'm kind of. Ready, ready for another cup of coffee and grind it out and get ready and, and figure out what else we forgot to get. We'll be doing that till, uh Thursday morning. Probably through Saturday, honestly. <laughs> we'll be third day of the convention. Like, Man, we did forget that daggum card reader or something. No, we're bringing spare card readers because last one gave us a little trouble. Yeah, oh. if we forget the card reader, I don't think we'd make it till Saturday. Mm-mm. Nope. So, folks, you don't know what the countdown is, do you? What is it? 28 days. That gummit. We're in weeks. No more months. Yep. 28 days until, that's that's crazy, because we'll, yeah. and we'll be busy. Yeah, I think we'll be at the, uh, Nashville this week. Mm-hmm. The next week, we will, um. Startville. That's Startville. Then the next week's March. Something that's like, crazy. No, that's it. Is I that think, right? Yeah. Or close to it, at least. It still feels like December to me. Yeah, I mean, we we will, uh, the 23rd will be in, in um, Starkville, and then the following Tuesday will be March 1st. There you go. Youth Weekend and stuff will start opening up. So that I think Youth Weekend will run the, um. Usually the 8th-ish. So yeah, it'll be the, uh. Well, with here with turkey season opening on a Tuesday, I don't know how that. I don't know if they're gonna run it on a on a Saturday, the Saturday and Sunday before our you know normal season opens, or if they're gonna still do it a whole weekend before. Yeah. But because last year was funky, the youth weekend touched the real one. Yeah. Is that what it was? Yeah, youth weekend was Saturday Sunday, and the opening day was Monday. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it was. So. But, I mean, turkey should be kind of – Lance said he'd been hearing them. That's why he – when Lance said, like, turkey's been gobbled, I'm like, yeah, right. I'm like, wait, I mean, it is getting to be late February. I mean, I've heard – I you know, you remember when I heard a turkey gobble that day on the refuge of Star Wars. Yeah. I called you about 10 minutes after daylight to tell you it was on your birthday. Yeah. And I was like, this is the earliest I've ever heard a turkey gobble, springish. Was he gobbling at anything more than just having a good day? No, but I was pumped. Oh, yeah. Because that was about the fourth morning in a row. I went to listen knowing I wasn't going to hear nothing. I just wanted to kind of like look around and have an excuse to put on a green leaf jacket and stand by my truck in the woods. Like just, you know, I just love doing stuff like that. I mean, I could do that every day if I knew there was a chance I could hear one. And you can bet your bottom dollar I was there about the next 14 days doing the same. <laughs> See if I could hear another one. I don't think I did until, you know, that first week of March, really. I don't know. I don't want to get too far. Up. I try to contain it. I got that January wave, you know, we we're talking about. You, usually how I am that week after the convention, I'm I'm out listening. It's, it ain't it ain't no, it's full throttle, pedal yeah. to the metal after the convention. Because that that's why I said, like, it's a kickoff. It is. The ball game starts then, and then the business part feel like starts, and that the mind is shifting, and then that overnight shift happens. And when that oh, overnight yeah. shift happens, it's game on. Yep, it's it's kind of a different breed of a person, just a different mindset, a different 
stature. I mean, different posture, different. Different everything. Yeah. Your whole demeanor changes. Yep. 28 days. 28 days. Hmm. All right, folks. That's all we got. Well, you or I or our listeners fall asleep, I'm sure. I hope we weren't as monotone as we probably really were as we're hanging on by a thread here. But we're looking forward to seeing a lot of y'all in Nashville um, this Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Again, combined CS booth three or four. I don't think it's going to be hard to miss us, but we'll have some stuff up on the story and stuff. Follow along for the um, podcast stuff. We're going to be right there in a plexiglass room. Clear should be able to see us. Probably the ones, there, there'll be four there. Three of them will be talking on it. One of the booths will be sitting there trying to figure out how to plug all the stuff up. That's probably going to be us. That'll be us. Yep. That'll probably be us because um, uh, we're still winging it. It's the name of the game. Yep. And uh, we will see you all there. Guys, we appreciate any reviews, any stars you can give us on uh, Spotify. Speaking of which, I looked at Primo's the other day, Lake and Jordan are kicking our butt in the star race. We ain't got a star race, but I was like, Dad, they got like 100 more than we do. So if you listen to us on Spotify, take a second, please. One star, five stars, I don't care how many stars, but. Oh, five stars. I mean, I'm I'm down for as many as they'll let you. I give think us. that's all they can. I think that's all they can select is five stars. Really? I don't think they can do four, three, two, or one. They're probably broken. Now that yeah, they're broken. That. Yeah. So, but nonetheless, we gotta we gotta step our game up if they're gonna be that far ahead of us on the ratings. So yeah, but regardless, we appreciate. It. If you just want to spread the word, you ain't gotta give us a star. I don't care. You just tell a friend about us, share an episode with them through text message. That's fine with me. You send us a DM, say what you'd like, didn't like, say some stuff you want us to cover. Tell us to stop covering. Yeah. We listening. But um nonetheless, guys, we appreciate y'all listening in every week. Looking forward to uh to seeing a lot of y'all and looking forward to a lot of turkey hunt stories to come. Thanks again for listening to the Spring Legend Podcast. We'll see y'all next time.